we have our uh, we have our guest on the line. So, um, without further ado, I, I would I would like to introduce uh, a man who I I consider to be uh, an architect of my childhood, pretty much. Um, and I know that's probably going to make him feel old. I'll have to apologize for that when we bring him on. Um, okay, so, so uh, without further ado, I'll introduce him, uh, Mr. Phil Lawler. Phil, how are you this evening? I'm doing very well, thank you, sir. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for coming on the show. I know it's late over where you are, and uh, you're probably staying up to be on with us, but uh, we really appreciate it. It's late everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we we have uh, the main reason that you're on the show this evening. Uh, you have a, a new project that you're working on, isn't that right? That's right, that's right, that's right. Yes, uh, the project is called Iliad House. And it's a brand new audio drama series, um, and uh, my my partners and I are um, doing it all on our own. We don't have any kind of organization backing us or anything like that. We're doing this independently, and uh, oh. so we're we're very excited about it, and uh, we're, we're trying to crowdfund it through Kickstarter, and uh, so we that, that that's basically it. I mean, we uh, a lot of people have asked me if it's uh, associated with Adventures in Odyssey. It isn't. It isn't associated with Adventures in Odyssey or Focus on the Family or anything like that, but uh, we are we are having a good time trying to get it backed and, mm. and get it on the and, and and get it get it up and running. What can you tell us about Iliad House? Well, Iliad House is a uh, from from the practical side. Iliad House is a um, an audio drama aimed at uh, nine to fourteen year olds, and uh, basically the story involves a young man named. Jesse Davidson. And Jesse is an orphan. He was orphaned when he was three. His parents were killed. And uh, he kind of bounced around from foster home to foster home to foster home. And then uh, he discovered, and he and the authorities discovered, that uh, he had an uncle he never knew he had. And his uncle is this kind of a strange, unusual, very intelligent. He used to teach uh, at the university, has a couple of PhDs, a uh, man uh, named Christopher Portalis. And Christopher lives at this really unusual. It's, it's, it's a reason that it's a great match for him. He owns this place called Iliad House, and Iliad House sits at the uh, southern tip of an island called Verity Island, and uh, the island rests off the east shore of the United States. And um, strange and unusual things happen in and around Iliad House. Um, the whole idea behind this is that there are kind of uh, places in the world where unusual strange, odd, and supernatural things happen. And Iliad House is one of those places. And Christopher Portalis kind of figures into this in a very, very um, uh, important way in terms of uh, what happens in and around Iliad House. And uh, Jesse is coming to live at Iliad House. Actually, when we uh, when we first meet Jesse, he's been living there about two years. And uh, one of the things that happens immediately, uh, not immediately, but when, when, our, when we first start our series... Um, one of the things that Jesse discovered upon first coming to Elliott House was an old train, uh, 1860s era locomotive and a coal car and a caboose. And he and his friends have been using this as a clubhouse for about a year. Um, and, uh, you know, they thought, okay, well, this, this thing is just all, all sitting here by itself and all stationary and nobody's doing anything with this, so we'll turn it into a clubhouse. And then about a year into after using it for about a year they discover that this train is not only is not stationary it can actually move but it moves through time um and they have <laughs> uh, they, they go through all sorts of adventures on this train that's the pilot series uh they have to go they go back and forth through time they learn a lot of uh deep dark secrets about themselves and some not not so pleasant truths about themselves and uh, they also learn that there's forgiveness and redemption when, uh, when, when uh, for, for everyone who asks for it and needs it. And then Jesse learns that um, he is uh, he and his uncle are both at Iliad House for uh, a, a much greater reason than anybody realized. So that starts it off. Those are the, that kicks off the whole adventure of, of Iliad House right there. I I I can't tell you how excited I am about it. Like you said, it's for nine to fourteen year olds mainly, but. I mean, just like I just like a lot of the episodes that you wrote for Odyssey, I'm sure that it would be far-reaching as far as people that would enjoy it, right? Full appeal, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping so. I mean, the whole idea behind this is that uh, y years ago, when I was s s still.
working on Odyssey, and we were doing a lot of different kinds of things. I always had an idea that I'd like to do a, a kind of a spinoff of Odyssey for older, for, 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 for the older kids, um, t- little, you know, t- older, older listeners, um, not just kids, but uh, and, and Odyssey is really more for families and kids than, than just kids too. But that's the way this right. is going to be. But um, uh, you know, nothing ever came of that, and uh, and and again. I, I kind of had this idea in the back of my head for a long, long time, and uh, but nothing happened at that time point, and that idea has changed a lot. This is, again, as I said, not affiliated with Adventures in Odyssey or Focus on the Family at all. It's a completely independent series. Um, but, uh, you know, the technology is now available for us to be able to do this, and uh, we, we, we're, uh, we're really excited that we can, uh, you know, we... The, the possibility exists for us to do this independently, crowdfunding it uh, through Kickstarter, which is going on right now, by the way, that campaign is. And uh, and also just the technology of um, how how it would be produced, um, how we can he, we can work on uh, on recording actors all over the country, which I I do, and then bringing all their you know those their, they send all their voice tracks into me and I produce it on the, on a, on a, into a coherent drama and it actually works I mean, I've, I've been really surprised yeah. at how the like, technology has changed that much so uh, we're very very excited it sounds it sounds amazing um, and I, I just have to tell you just the general overview that you gave may I just say and Josh you can echo me if you so desire mind blown <laughs> Um, seriously, for 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 a you know for just an overview of like your you know your 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 just your first few episodes or whatever you know or even even your first season or uh, whatever you want to however you want to describe it um, <laughs> that is that is epic. Well, we one of the things that I've all, I, I really kind of want to do is 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 take on subject matter that may not. Uh, it's not that it hasn't been taken on. It's just that in in in, in Christian circles and in you know in circles where people are believers and stuff, they don't really take on these kinds of stories. We kind of shy away from things like time travel and things like we're going to do <laughs> stories right, about right. alternate dimensions and other planets and other worlds and supernatural things and stuff like that. And and that's just not stuff that you normally hear in a typical show that is uh, that is uh, you know whose primary audience. Uh, certainly not the only audience, but primary audience is, is the, the Christian community. Uh, but I, I don't want to shy away from those things. I mean, I, I like those stories. I think I think there are lots of people out there who like those stories, and uh, we shouldn't be afraid of things like that. If, if if God is anywhere, He's everywhere. He is the God of time. He is the God of space. He is the God of infinite dimensions. Um, he is the God of the supernatural, and we should be able to find Him and look for Him in all of those places. So uh, that's why I want to kind of take over all, t- take on those kinds of stories and have fun with them. And you know, the, 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 there, there are plenty of shows like this and movies like this and stuff like that on, on television that, that take on that kind of subject matter, but they don't take it on from, from uh, you know, they don't have a Christian worldview in taking this, the, those kinds of stories on. And I think it's about time that um, we do, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, with Adventures in Odyssey, there were the the, the 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 theology, and it kind of, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It it kind of got a little you know heavy handed in some episodes. You know, every episode had its own moral. Every episode had its own Bible verse or multiple Bible verses attached to it. Sure. Is that the kind of thing that you're doing with Iliad House, or is it going to be just more the Christian worldview of it without without it being as heavy handed? I think that uh, we will we will use Bible verses when it's appropriate to do so within the context mm-hmm. of a story, mm-hmm. but um, I, I I we we will we will not do as <clears throat> as Adventures in Odyssey has done and other shows have done that I've worked on have done where we where where we, exactly what you said where you know we have the Bible verse and then we we draw, we pull a moral out of the story. Uh, this mm-hmm. is more of a story that's presented from the Christian worldview. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll treat the audience uh, as grown-ups, and uh, not that Adventures in Odyssey doesn't do that, but we, we're going to let the audience understand that, you know, they have to pay attention, <laughs> and they have, to, yeah. they have to derive this sort of thing from, um, from what, you know, from the story itself. 
and it'll That's be there. Really I mean, there's no question about it. It's going to be. It's going to be. We're not. We don't. We don't apologize for trying to hide what we are and who we are uh, at all. We again, we have a legitimate and and what we believe, of course, is the best worldview there is. And it's going to show up in everything that we do. Um, it's C.S. Lewis's old thing of you know it's not that we don't we don't need more Christian writers. We need more writers who are Christians who write about everything. Absolutely and, and, uh, right, right. That's what I'm taking. That's yeah, that's what I'm taking to heart here and trying to trying to trying to do. I mean, Lewis did that very very well. I thought in the Chronicles of Narnia, it's not like he had. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in fact, in all of his fiction work, he it's not like he. You know, Put chapter and verse down on every single thing, but you could you could pick chapter and verse out of a lot of different things that he did. So, um, right, same same kind of thing. Right, right. Um, now, are you you you've said in in um, now I've I obviously know a little bit more about the projects that because I'm a backer and whatnot than than the listening audience <laughs> would. Um, is are, will there be any familiar voices? Shall we say? Oh yeah. I think you'll find that there are some familiar voices. Now, uh, in saying that, um, I'm, I've always been a fan of, of um, programs and of particular authors and directors of media who use the same folks in show after show after show, but give them something else to do so Absolutely. that they're not so typecast. Um, <coughs> so in saying, excuse me, for I got a little cold, Saying that uh, there are going to be some familiar voices, yes, there will, but they they may be in roles in which you don't recognize them. So, oh. um, so hopefully, what what's going to happen is that we'll have these uh, these wonderful performers that uh, that everybody knows and everybody has come to love over the years, uh, but they'll be doing things that they haven't done before, different kinds of roles. So. That's that's the whole idea behind this. Uh, uh, give, give them something to stretch and something to latch onto and something to play with and uh, have fun creating themselves. Could I could I ask just a sort of a a, a slightly more um, uh, to the to the point on on that? Are you are you are you basically saying that you're going to be hearing voices that you will recognize from like Adventures in Odyssey, for instance, um, just in a different role? Or are you going to be hearing a voice that you would have recognized from Adventures in Odyssey and suddenly say, uh, you know, our listeners re- know know my voice, but um, no, if I suddenly started coming in talking like this, they might not quite recognize me right off the bat. <laughs> Something like that. Are you? Is, is that the answer? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm hoping that you know they're going to they're going to have uh some so some some voices may instant, be instantly recognizable. Some characters are oh, I know who that is. Exactly. I know exactly who that is. But some may not, you know. And then the whole the the, the neat thing about that is if we can, you know, if I if we do it right and things are are done well, and which I have no doubt of, of the actors ability to do this. It's always wonderful when people find out later on. They go, "Oh, that was that was that person. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, what I really exactly. love. You know, when you go, oh, I can't believe that was the same person. That's the same actor. Oh my gosh, that's great. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, that that is very exciting to me. The prospect of being able to do something else that uh, and and you know they're, they're recognized for doing one thing, but then they come along, and they do something else. Or you know, you may just get a little twinge. <laughs> this was that's the great thing about radio. Uh, the great thing about audio broadcasting and audio programming is that um, you 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 kind of you kind of know where have I heard that? There's something about that that's familiar, but I still can't place it. And then you go back and go, oh yeah yeah yeah, that's who that is. Oh yeah yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. You know, um, mm-hmm. that that's when it's really fun. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now, exactly. Uh, now, um, I know it's I know it's been. Just about fourteen years since you've been on Odyssey, but you, would you mind if we ask you some questions about Odyssey? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Oh, I've right. actually been on a couple of episodes in the recent, uh, some of the recent albums. Uh, mm. This old, this is the old character that used to play Dale Jacobs. They brought him back. Right. For a right. Of things, yeah. So. Oh, oh yeah. I haven't, wow. written, I haven't written anything for the show for a while, so. Mm-hmm. Um. 
now, I, as I stated when I when I was bringing you on, I I I grew up on Odyssey, and I'm sorry if that if that makes you feel old at all. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, no, but, that doesn't make me feel old. What makes me feel old is that two of the characters that we had as kids on Odyssey from the very beginning are now married and right, have yeah. kids of their own. So <laughs> that makes me feel a lot older. <laughs> And now, and now they're and now they're saying, "Hey, you know, uh, you know, we're we're really excited about your new project. You know, we're going to have our kids listening to it." <laughs> uh, their kids, some of their kids are old enough almost to get married and have kids of their own. That's how old I feel. So. Oh. Oh goodness. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. Yeah. Like like I had said, uh, I I grew up on it, and like for instance, the 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 complete guide to Odyssey that you wrote, I used that as a checklist when I was growing up, on. Uh, <laughs> on episodes that I had listened to and that I hadn't listened to. And um, one of the, one of, and literally my favorite series um, was the one that you had your hands all in was Darkness Before Dawn. Uh, yeah. Um, you you directed six episodes and you wrote six episodes of it, am I right? I think that's uh, correct, yes. Yeah. Um, who, now, in, in when you when you were writing Odyssey, who was your favorite character to write, and why was it Dr. Regis Blaggard? <laughs> uh, well, I had a lot of favorite characters to write, um, but <laughs> the fun thing about Dr. Blaggard is, uh, was that we, prior to him, we didn't really have a villain, per se. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, we kind of had some bullies and stuff like that, but we didn't really have anybody that was a major... Uh, you know, proponent of the opposite of what Wit and everybody else in town believed. Right. And the uh, the fun thing about writing for him was to not make him, you know, one dimensional or two dimensional character. Try to really flesh him out and give him mm-hmm. more than that. There's you know, there's a reason why he's doing some of the things that he that he does. And um, and so it was, it was just it was just kind of neat to write. <laughs> right from the dark side for a little while. Right, and, absolutely. Uh, and uh, it's 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 you know it's fun to take on that that kind of character and see how you can make him come to life. And of course, the 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 character owes so much. I mean, so much of what we did we owe to Earl Bowen, who did the voice char- vocal characterization. Uh, mm-hmm. That that voice was just so wonderful, and you go, wow, oh, I mean, yeah. Earl was just awesome. So, uh, so we we owe a great deal of gratitude to Earl, but um, yeah, he was he was fun because we get we got a chance to explore some, um, you know, to, to explore some of these arguments that we all have and some of these storylines that we all have from both sides. We could we could take on the issue from both sides, and uh, and you know s- s- present you know present what we feel is the better side. I mean, this mm-hmm. is, this is a this is a big thing. This is an epic battle, and. Uh, um, so that that's why I think I really liked Blaggard more than anything else. He was he was he was a fun character. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now um, your your writing credits. Um, you wrote uh, obviously you wrote like I think it was like three hundred episodes or something like that from what I read. Something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, you had a very large amount of episodes though that came with parental warnings tacked on. Um, now, the, well, now, uh, now uh, you know why I wanted to do Iliad House. <laughs> right, of course, of course. Was there anything in your time in Odyssey, or your time in writing or directing for Odyssey, that you wanted to do that you that got nixed by um, some family? Well, you know, actually, I did. I did a couple of episodes that uh, we only aired once, um, but I think have been subsequently put on other collections. Of you know, kind of the lost episodes, um, I did it. I did a. a, a I did a, I talk about trains. I did a, a thing aboard a train. Um, way late. Uh, was was that way late in the Windy City, or was it a different? No, one? it was a different one. It was a, a mystery okay. aboard a train. Okay. It was, a, it was like a murder mystery aboard a train. It was. It, it all ended up being a big ruse. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, I think it was Wit's birthday, and Eugene had made this big uh, kind of murder mystery aboard a train. And, oh, okay. uh, oh yeah, it, it I think I remember the one you're talking about. Yeah, now, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was a whole lot of fun to do that episode too. That was just a great amount of fun. But they felt that it was too intense for younger listeners, so it aired once, and we got some negative mail. So we said, okay, well, we're not going to air that one again. But again, I think they I think they put that one in a in a, in a collection somewhere. Um, there were other ones that we did. That um, one one of the ones in particular that I did 
um, at one point, Focus on the Family was going through a very big public policy um, phase where they wanted to, they wanted every department in the in the organization to deal with public policy, different kinds of public policy issues. Mm-hmm. And so that even came down to us. You know, how can we deal with with things that are, that are talking about public policy? And one of the things that we were talking about was um, uh, the the advent of homosexuality in schools and things like that. And so I wrote an episode called One in Ten. And uh, it, I think it dealt with um, a young man who was helping Jimmy Barkley out of a, of a scrape. Some, I think that's how it worked at one point. And then that young man ends up being uh, a spokesman for gay rights. And he goes into uh, Jimmy's elementary school. And there was this big thing about how does this happen and what, why did it happen and who, who said what and when, when, when and where. And so we, we were starting to, to go down this public policy path. And... I think Paul had actually Paul McCusker had actually written an episode called Pamela Has a Problem that was about abortion, right? And um, and and we we did the one <laughs> that was kind of the first one that we did, and before we could get to the rest of them, <laughs> Chuck Chuck Bolte sort of came in and, and had a talk with everybody and said, I don't think we should be doing this, guys. <laughs> I mean, this is this is not the kind of show that this is supposed to be. We're not really supposed to be hitting this stuff to this audience, and so they, I think calmer heads prevailed and so one in ten never got I think we uh, I think we recorded it but it never got produced so those mm. raw tapes are sitting in their in their archives somewhere uh, oh. I doubt that they'll ever be produced at this point but um, uh, you know things, it, things like that we got there was well it, it, and you know the episode from what I remember had had story which was fine at the very beginning it's like the first half of it was was actual story with things that are going on kind of linear linear told but then the latter part of it ended up like I don't know if you ever remember the uh, show Quincy. There was a there used to be a show called Quincy Medical Examiner. Right. Jack Klugman played Quincy, and the thing yeah. that always got me about Quincy is that you know he was solving these murders and these these murder mysteries and stuff when he was a medical examiner. He would look at the evidence and he would be very forensic about it. And there was always a story that went along first, but at one at some point the story stopped, and he just sort of took over and did these monologues about. Uh, <laughs> You know, very clinical monologues about how how a medical examiner does what a medical examiner does, and it kind of stopped being a show, and it ended up being a documentary about medical examiners, and that's kind of right. what happened with this one. It stopped being a you know, it stopped being an episode, and it ended up being a documentary about you know what what happens when with, with homosexuality in the schools, and I'm like, hmm, that's kind of strange. So, um, I you know, the, I, the whole episode just like I said, is sitting on a shelf somewhere. I don't think anybody's going to do anything with it. Now, well, that's there, sort of a bummer, now, actually. <laughs> were there any were there any episodes that that you wrote that, looking back, you kind of were maybe maybe have changed your mind on things that you you know things that you put in, just different theology, possibly you've changed your mind on, or that kind of thing. No, I, I can't really, I can't really think that. I don't really, there, I, I can't think of anything that. And from that respect that I would have changed, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't think that, you know, the shows are what they are. I think that um, the only thing that I might have changed would be I wrote a school that I, I, I've actually had to, kind of, a show that I actually had to apologize for it uh, with a bunch of homeschoolers. There was a show that I did really early on about homeschooling, and it was <laughs> so evident that I knew nothing about homeschooling when I wrote the show. <laughs> Oh uh, my since, gosh! I, have since met I remember many, many that show. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and they were like, mm, you know, I wish you'd talk to us because it's not really what we are and what we do. <laughs> and I said, yeah, here's, you're right. I should have. I should have. So here's here's the here's the really funny part, and, and uh, uh, you you might get a laugh out of this. Um, Josh and I were both homeschooled. <laughs> ah. Yep. Um, and and here's the best part: when your show came out. My mother had just started getting into um, the the activism side of it, uh, right? Um, and so we were one of the families that sent a letter off to focus on the family, uh, <laughs> uh, and to and yeah, we 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 were actually one of the one of those people who sent letters into to you and to the to the rest <laughs> of the guys saying, hey, um, just to just to give you an idea, this is this is. What our our day looks like, and this is what homeschooling actually <laughs> is about, and so on and so forth. And, and but if I recall correctly, I actually stated in that I loved the show, but this is you know this is a point that was kind of off, and this is actually how it would have gone. 
Um, yeah. And then I really liked this part, but this part was off, and this is how it would have – that sort of thing. So uh, it's really funny you bring that up because I'm sitting here and, like, it just the, the, the good old times are rolling back. <laughs> Well, what's, now, also, uh, what's really interesting about that, this is uh, one, one more thing to add to that, the irony of all that. Uh, well, maybe not irony, but the, the fun of all that is my partners in Iliad House are all homeschoolers, all of them. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I met, these, I met the guys um, and ladies that I'm working with um, because I, they're, they all work for the uh, HSLDA Group, HSLD, school. Legal Defense. Yeah. They all they all work for them. <laughs> I awesome. I was they, they contacted me about a year ago and I went to one of their Generation Joshua camps and um did did a little presentation for one of their I govern camps and I've done that for two years in a row now and then I also went to their convention last year, their their annual convention and taught radio drama to a bunch of homeschoolers. So um and they were it was great it was wonderful and I was like wow okay yep. I wish I had known I wish I had known about this when I wrote that episode you know 20 <laughs> yeah. years ago 25 years ago now um the uh, of course I forgot what I was going to ask um <laughs> Andrew did you have any questions yeah actually um so you're talking about you're you're talking about what you know having having episodes getting um uh basically blacklisted um were there any other challenges that you ran into simply by virtue of being under the Focus on the Family umbrella? Uh, well, it's always hard to... Um, the, 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 there were a couple. When you write a show and you're dealing with good versus evil, you, you which frequently we did on Adventures in Odyssey... Right. Um, it's it's difficult to write a show, uh, good versus evil, when good seems to be um, to have all sorts of restrictions placed on it in the battle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, right. You know, we we and and that's just kind of the way real life is anyway. I mean, evil evil doesn't have any restrictions. That's why it's evil. Um, good often says, okay, well, we can't, you know, you can't do that, and you can't do that, and you can't do that, and you can't do that, which is why we have to leave the battle up to the Lord. So mm-hmm. um, that was, that was, uh, that could be a bit frustrating, but actually it ends up that it's not frustrating. It just makes for better stories, I think. Better, you know, telling them is a little bit more right. difficult, but it just makes for better stories. One thing that we did kind of have <clears throat> a bit of a uh, restriction on uh, it's not really a restriction. It's just the nature of the way. Again, the way things happen with Christian audiences. Uh, we right, had a character right. early on called uh, Officer Harley. I don't know if ah, you the Harley, Harley debacle. <laughs> but that that character went the way of all good things because um, you know he was a police officer and we had a lot of fun with him and he was funny and uh, Will Ryan played him and played him to excellent. He was <laughs> played him in a very excellent and funny way and we were able to write a lot of fun stuff for him. But because he was a police officer, people thought we were dissing police officers, and we weren't. We were just saying this guy was had a you know when when Officer Harley did police things, he was very good. But he just had a different way and a unique way of looking at the world, and it was funny and it was kind of goofy, and people didn't like that. So we went back and forth and back and forth, and finally, you know, we tried to redeem him, but it just ended up not happening and word came down from the highest levels that focus on the family actually the highest level <laughs> saying get rid of that character we don't want to ever wow. hear him again get rid of him oh no you don't and want to so, hear the dobson phone ring yeah we we really yeah we 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 don't want to hear that again so we said okay he's gone he's out of here goodbye so long <laughs> so that was um, it was kind of sad we had a farewell for him and everything and then of course we sort of resurrected the idea of the character in harlow doyle but mm-hmm. it was it was never really the same as Officer Harley. We had so much fun with Officer Harley. Right. Um, now, you, have you ever directed anything live action? I know you you directed other um, voiceover work other than Odyssey and other radio drama. Have you ever directed anything live action? Like a motion picture or something? Or a short or anything like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have done a few of those. Uh, nothing worth really mentioning. <laughs> I think I have well, a couple of things on the internet or something uh, somewhere. There, you know, people people have done some different things with them, and uh, they were usually things. When I was going through grad school, I did a couple of shorts. We had a, a whole 
series of uh, shorts that we put together. I don't know that mine has. Uh, I don't think I've actually put mine in a form that could actually go on YouTube yet. But um, it was a mini series, and it was a visual mini series, and it was it was it was a lot of fun to do that. But um, well, the reason <laughs> why do you that ask, I ask, you have an idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason that I ask is, is I'm. I'm in my, in my roundabout way of, of asking, it, what are the different challenges, you know, between the, the differences between directing a voiceover actor versus directing a, 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 a live action actor? Well, I can say that, you know, you, when you say live action, I've also directed a, a great many stage, you know, live stage shows. So mm-hmm. um, those are there's a visual element that goes along with those. Oh, directing yeah. something right. well, that, visually um, <clears throat> is is that you have one more. One more element that you that you need to be very concerned about. You have to get the effort. As far as the actors are concerned, they have to not only sound right; they have to look right. Uh, they have to be able to mm-hmm. play the role and look the way you want them to look. And um, you also have scenery and backdrops and you know settings and all sorts of things that you have to take care of uh, in in motion pictures and and in on the stage and on television. Um, whereas in audio drama, you don't have to worry about that. But um, I I really love audio drama uh, for the for that very reason. Um, I think it's a, a, a for me I think it's the best way to tell stories. And the mm-hmm. reason why is because um, movies are wonderful, television shows are wonderful, stage shows are wonderful, but um, they're passive. Um, they're passive in that you don't have to bring anything to them. The mm-hmm. audience doesn't have to bring anything to them. You you go to see a movie because you're <clears throat> you, you're expecting everything to be laid out for you. Mm-hmm. So the director's vision of everything is there, and you don't have to bring anything to the table at all. <coughs> no imagination, no nothing. With with audio drama, you have to bring your imagination. Um, we provide <coughs> you with stories and with the. Uh, uh, Backdrop in terms of the, the audio sound effects and the performances of the actors, but you have to be engaged. You have to bring your imagination. You have to use your brain. You have to use your mind. You're, the theater of the mind is very active. And what's wonderful about right. that is that it, it could be anything, and it's going to be different for everybody. Everybody's <laughs> going to bring a different thing to that. Um, uh, every Adventures in Odyssey episode that you hear and every subsequent episode of everything that I've ever done in Jungle Jam and Friends and in Kids Corner and in Paws and Tales and anything else that I've worked on, everybody's going to have a different way of thinking, of, of imagining what the characters look like, what the setting looks like, what's going on, how it all works. And, and that's what's really, really wonderful about audio drama storytelling. Uh, from mm-hmm. a practical side as well, when the amounts of money that are involved in mounting a, a theatrical show or in producing a motion picture or television series you have a lot of middlemen a lot oh of yeah and mm. they are going to put their two cents in and rightfully as they should it's their money um, right and they're going to put their two cents in in how that looks and what happens with it and how it and so you can't really tell the story that you want to tell as the writer and as the creator of the series, you can kind of tell a story that you want to tell, but it's going to go through a whole lot of other people because when you're spending that kind of money on, a, say, a motion picture, uh, the people who have invested in the motion picture are trying to hedge their bets. They, they want to make money, that, that money back and profit. And so they're going to do what they can to, in order to do that. That's it's the, basically the business side of things. Well, that certainly is the case in audio programming, too. Don't get me wrong. There is definitely that kind of component, but it's far less. Um, and you and, and the artists now, the artists like myself and, and the storytellers like myself and the people who do this sort of thing, get a chance to tell the stories they really want to tell in the way they want to tell them. And that's really that's what's really lovely and wonderful about audio drama. Okay. <laughs> now, um, I can, we can kind of just, I can kind of, Gift wrap this all the way back around to Iliad House, and we can kind of. Unless Andrew has any other more qu- other questions, we. we I just have, I just ahead. have one. I just have one more. Just one more, and that is, what were your what were your thoughts, um, when it was announced that uh, Adventures in Odyssey, uh, you know, the audio program, was going to be turned into an animated, uh, video series. 
Well, um, at first I was really excited about it, and I thought it was going to be a really fun thing, and because I thought I was going to be able to work on it. Right. Um, and um, I, I did work on it in terms of doing voices. I came in and did the f- voice of the dad of uh, for the first, I think, three or four episodes. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> and I don't really know what's happened after that because I, I kind of stopped following it. But um, right. But again, that was a, that was a, there's there's a prime example of uh, because there's a lot of money being spent on it. Animation costs a lot of money, um, and <clears throat> They kind of they kind of turned it over to the people that they thought were experts at that point. Um, so I was really excited about it at first, saying, "Okay, yeah, now we get to actually take what we've created here and we get to guide it and mold it and, and turn it into something that's visual, and hopefully we can maintain some of what we've done on the audio side in the visual side." But uh, right. but that was sort of you know that was sort of taken away, and uh, and and they 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 went to people who had done video before um, in, in other areas because none of us had really done any animated video at that point and uh, right. and I you know I I looked at that and said well I don't I don't I wasn't very happy with it <laughs> to be quite honest with you I don't know oh, wow. if, if, if many of us were on, on the um, on the audio side of it were all that happy but <clears throat> when I was younger I mean when it first happened I was like really oh, that's just oh I was, I was not happy with it um but I've since come to realize that there are a lot of people who really love the the, uh, the videos. They they think they're really yeah. good, and they really like them. And and I, you know, who am I to say no? I mean, who am I to question that? That's not um, that people like what they like, and uh, there are a lot of right. people who come to Odyssey through the videos. And God bless them. That's fantastic. Um, I'm, I, I have no problem with that at all. Um, there was it, one, but, there, but it's uh, but it's interesting to me. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying before. It's interesting to me that that people who come to Adventures in Odyssey and who've known Adventures in Odyssey and the audience that we built up on the audio side were were surprised. And I think at first, not they were kind of like, well, that's that's not the way I think Wit looks. That's not the yeah. way I think that Odyssey looks. I think Odyssey looks different. Why do you know? Well, yeah. How come? It, how come it did that? How come it looked like that? And it's not that they didn't like the videos. It's just that it wasn't. It wasn't the way they had imagined it. It's the same thing as reading a book. You know, that's why a lot of novelizations um, very rarely are really successful when they are, are adapted for the screen. Because, um, you know, there was a big flap, for instance, when Gone with the Wind was adapted for, for a, as a movie. Now, the movie itself was, all by itself, was a very, very successful movie. But right. there were a lot of people who were like, hmm, I don't, I don't think that's who I would cast as Scarlett O'Hara. I don't think that's who I right. would cast as... This and this and the only the only general consensus that was completely uh, a, a yes was Clark Gable as Red Butler. I mean, because mm-hmm. she basically, <laughs> when you read the book, she basically describes Clark Gable. Um, right. So, um, but that's about the only thing that people that anybody is really happy with. Um, Mary Travers. There's a movie coming out now called uh, Saving Mr. Banks. I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and that that the whole the whole the whole. Um, the whole uh, myth, the, the whole folklore, the whole movie is about the idea that that uh, the Travers disliked the movie Mary Poppins. She didn't like mm-hmm. it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the apocryphal story—I don't know if it's actually true or not—but the story goes that she came in for the screening. Walt Disney had a big deal and came in for the screening, the initial you know, public screening of the movie. And uh, after the movie was <laughs> over, the screening was over, she turned and said, "Okay, when when are you going to fix it?" <laughs> yeah. And then Walt was like, "Fix it! It's it's done. This is it." And she goes, "Oh, surely you're not. That's not. That can't be. That's that's not right. That's not. This is terrible." She didn't like it at all. So, um, you know, it's just it's just a, it's the different it, it, it's the difference between the medium, the medium. Yeah. Right? And uh, and that's that's kind of the way it works. But people like what they like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I brought it up. I brought I brought it up because I remember I, the one comment that stuck in, that has stuck in my head all these years was um, a friend of mine looking at the the animated movie and going, you know, for some reason every time I heard Wit, I never expected him to look like Wilfred Brimley. <laughs> 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 And for some reason, that has just stuck in my head ever since. <laughs> you know, you want to know what the you know what is really funny about that? 
that? When Steve Harris and I were trying to come up with a description for wit, one of the first things he came up with was he had snapped an image uh, from a TV commercial, and the image was Wilford Brimley. <laughs> 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 you know, the, my biggest problem <laughs> he, and he, the, uh, he walked in, he walked into our, 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 our meetings, and I'm sitting down, I'm trying to come up with the, with the character of Wit and what he's like and who he's like, and he said, well, maybe this is what he looks like. <laughs> it's like it was Wilford Brimley. He was doing the Quaker Oats commercial. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I will say my biggest problem with the, uh, with the videos, the, the animated videos, was that that was not what the Imagination Station looked like in my head. <laughs> Um, that was a big. That was a big slap. I mean, we had that, and we went back and forth with that for a long, long time. Just, mm-hmm. uh, just Paul McCusker and I just went back and forth, and and uh, even when even when we had created the Imagination Station for the audio side of things, um, mm-hmm. you know, my my description was always it's very much like the uh, the holodeck in Star Trek: The Next Generation. Right. And Paul was very much. Uh, I think Paul was thinking more Doctor Who. Uh, he was thinking more of the TARDIS, except that was you know. We, we, and from his point of view, the imagination station was if anybody's walking outside and they look in, they're just going to see somebody sitting there um, mm. because it's all happening in their imagination. And my thing is, no, if anybody was walking outside and they looked in, they'd see a whole scene going on. Uh, right. You know, and the characters were interacting in the whole scene. And so we went back and forth with that for a long, long time. But uh, mm. uh, I think that they just, uh, I, don't, I don't know that anybody, uh, and again, this is what's so wonderful about audio drama that everybody brings their own interpretation to it and you can do I mean I, I, I say this now I really still think this is true but uh, it's, it's, it's less and less true as the days go on and <clears throat> as technology gets better um, Stan Freeberg used to talk about this a lot when he was because he was he's of course the, the king of audio stuff right um, yeah and, and he used to say you know who what, what, people used to ask him if you had the choice to to do a movie or 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 do uh, of another record, a recording or something on the radio. What would you do? And he said, "Oh, I would pick radio every time. I'd pick audio every time." And they said, well, "Why?" If you had the chance to to direct a movie, write and direct a movie, he said, "All right, um, come with me." And you know, he opens the door and he says, "Here we are at Lake Erie, and Lake Erie is in the background, you know." And as so I'm going to drain Lake Erie, hey, drain it, guys! You hear the plug go pook, and the uh, <laughs> Lake Erie is being drained. And now we're going to plug it back up, and we're going to fill Lake Erie with hot chocolate. Go ahead, boys. And now we're going to fly in some whipped cream. And here comes the big cherry from the helicopter. Boom, and we're putting it right on top. And there's a big, there's Lake Erie filled with hot chocolate and whipped cream and a cherry on top. Do that in a movie. That's what he used to say. And, you know, well, like I, I said, that. nowadays with technology the way it is, you know, you, you probably could do that in the movie, but um, it would cost a whole lot of money right. to yeah. do it in a movie. Uh, whereas my just telling you that story, you know, and, and, and saying that story and with Stan Freeberg and with, did it with sound effects, everybody's imagination is instantly engaged. Everybody yep. is. is. You, can, you can imagine it, and it's right in your head, and it's right there. I can see Lake Erie filled with hot chocolate and whipped cream with a cherry on top. So, um, and that's what, again that goes back to you know different interpretations of what the imagination station was, and it didn't matter, of course, as long as it was audio. But as soon as you commit visually, well, now that changes everything. It not only right. changes everything for the videos, it goes back and changes everything audio-wise too. And so suddenly we have to think in terms of okay, now when we have <clears throat> people like in the Moses episodes, when Jimmy Barkley goes into the Imagination Station and his dad goes in after him, what does that mean? Why would his dad have to go in after him if all Jimmy is doing is just sitting there? Why can't dad just open up the door and yank him out of there? Right, um, of course. You know, why, why, why would he have to go in after him? So all of a sudden now we're thinking, oh, this is going back, this is all, all of a sudden we're going back to the litany of, of, of Imagination Station shows that we have done, and if we're committing visually in the videos that that's what the Imagination Station is, well, all of a sudden we've got you know kind of a problem here because uh, now it doesn't make quite make sense in what we've created in terms of the of the uh, of the audio stories. So um, you know, it, there's good and bad with both, but um, <clears throat> I think that again, uh, I think the audio stories are much more flexible in terms of how you can tell them. And they give the, the storyteller much more leeway. So yeah. <laughs> now, um, now I, we can 
I, I don't want to hold you for too much longer. So, like I said, I'll I'll kind of gift wrap this, bring it all the way back around to Iliad House. Um, we were talking about Harley and and things like that. You're great at at writing wacky characters, Harley, <laughs> Harlow, uh, Kevin from Three Two One Penguins. Um, <laughs> Will there be any surprise kind of wacky characters in Iliad House? Oh, I think all of them will be wacky. I, I think oh, the, awesome. potential, Great news. the potential for wackiness is in every single character that I write. Um, you know, or if not wackiness on their part, wackiness in the situation, which causes them to be wacky. My favorite stuff, my favorite more contemporary stuff, actually, this stuff is now 10 and even 20 years old. But uh, <clears throat> my, my favorite, one of my favorite contemporary writers is Joss Whedon. Um, of course, oh, yes. he's such yes. a great storyteller, and I just love the way he tells stories because he has he gives weight to the story where weight is needed, but he never mm-hmm. lets it go on for too long, and that's right. what's really without having some sort of funny thing happen. And um, if you go back to his series like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel and Firefly, yeah, there mm-hmm. are these moments that are really heavy and really dramatic, and they're dealing with that stuff, but they always are broken up with a punchline. <laughs> Somebody right. Always exactly. had something yeah. funny to say, you know. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite uh, Buffy moments is the character Spike was standing at top of the hill and overlooking Sunnyvale, and he was giving this really dramatic speech about what he's going to do and how he's going to rain terror, and it's really heavy duty and very dramatic. And he's going to be, and no one is going to stop him. And he instantly, you know, and then somebody comes along and he gets shot or something with a with a laser, you know, with a with a with a pellet gun or with a a, a tranquilizer dart. <laughs> He just kind of gets knocked out completely right in the middle of this really dramatic speech. He just gets knocked out completely, and it's like I love that about you know Whedon and, and writers like that that have um, no respect for the the ongoing dramatic soliloquy. <laughs> so let's go right. ahead, and, you know, let's go ahead and put a little comical bit in the middle of it. Uh, the, the Avengers movie that he just did was the, you know that last year was filled with that sort of thing. Right, you know, absolutely. Uh, my favorite, the one that everybody was always talking about, was Loki giving his real. I am enough of this. I am a god. I am. And then Hulk comes in and just beats the crud out of him and says, "Give me God." <laughs> Walks. Away. Yes. I mean, it's, a, Thank it's you. that kind of thing that's just really <laughs> fun and funny. And you go, "Yeah, let's put it in its proper perspective." Um, Firefly was also just filled with that sort of thing, just filled with it, and I love yeah. that. And that's 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 the kind of writing that I really like, and that's the kind of stuff that we're going to strive for in Elliot House too. Oh, that makes me so happy to hear. Same here. Um, so you can find Elliot House on Kickstarter right now. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. As a matter of fact, we just found out today that we we're one of the staff picks. Uh, we were a staff pick when when we first started. Uh, they really liked us, like day two that we were out and. Uh, we just found out that we were picked again as a staff pick. So if you go into Iliad House and you go to the staff picks, or if you go into Kickstarter and you go into the staff picks, you'll see uh, Iliad House right there. And, uh, it's actually front page right House. now. Yeah. Yep, so it's, go, it's on the front page. The site, yeah, and, uh, and, 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 and click onto it. And please, 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 anybody who's listening, if you want to support drama, you know, audio drama with great values and it's fun and funny and it's for the whole family, but we're going to be dealing with some really fun issues and great stuff and good storytelling. Please help us. Help us out because we're a long way away from our goal. <laughs> right. We're about and, Yeah. Right. We're about, about close to 14,000 now and we need to get to 100 by the end of the month and that's a long way to go. So, And with mm-hmm. Kickstarter, of course, it's all or nothing. You get, you know, If you don't reach your goal, you don't get anything. So we're, we're really going... We really need help. So, and if if I can go ahead and just point, just put put this out for our listeners, folks. Here's how here's how awesome this this is. Okay, and this is going to be. If you go to the Kickstarter page, Kickstarter.com, Iliad House is the number one, the very top of the list. Yeah, first on front the page. page right now, front page. So, um. Get get on it, get on it, folks. We're they're they're just about at fourteen grand right now. They 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 need a whole lot more. You are going to be contributing and and um, uh, really you're going you're going to be getting the 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 you know wheels off the ground of of a absolutely amazing amazing audio drama. And so, we thank um, you very much, very much for our, all, everybody who has supported us and everybody who will support us. We really, really thank you uh, for that. And you know, we've been very pleased. 
Um, I, I was <clears throat> very, very pleased with the whole Kickstarter campaign uh, that my partners and I pulled together. The video is, is really good. It's top-notch. we got a great artist in, in Cliff Cramp. Um, he has done so many different kinds of album covers for and book covers for Star Wars and for uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and, you know, for the Indiana Jones series and all sorts of different kinds of things. He's a fantastic artist. Um, our music uh, composer, um, we had a, a the theme for the series is written, and it's, it's there, too. You can hear the theme by Justin Durbin. Um, just really, really great people have come together and pulled together, and, um, and we're going to be posting some uh, audio clips of the of the show, of the pilot series. Uh, those are coming up in the next couple of uh, weeks, so please go back and tell your friends and tell tell everybody, tell everybody, tell everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, there you have it, Mr. Phil Lawler. We want to thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, indulging us, you know, with our nostalgia about Adventures in the Odyssey and bringing this new new project to our attention. Oh, you are very welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be on your show, and uh, I'm, I'm, it's great. Even though it's so early in the morning when it's done, it's just uh, you guys are fantastic, and uh, thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. All right, there we have wow. it. That was that was a great interview. That oh. was terrific. That was terrific. And folks, um, I know we we really didn't take any phone calls. We didn't give the number out or anything during the interview. Um, we didn't need to, man. Apo- was, uh, apologies, apologies to apologies for that. Only only because I, I try to do that for you know for listeners to ask questions of the, of our our interviewee. Uh, but in this case, we really wanted to make sure that he was able to to talk about his project, uh, get some get some questions answered, and and you know get 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 off to bed and, and get uh, get that cold of his back under control. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So um, 